pröva att stoppa om du tör I'm reminded of the story of, of some explorers who were in Africa and they saw these little boys playing with these little rocks. They were shooting marbles, a game similar to that. And these marbles, so to speak, were shiny and, and these explorers asked these little boys, say, here, taste this candy. Gave them some candy. Say, you like that? Say, yeah. Say, good. Tell you what, give me those marbles, I'll give you some more candy. And they did that. And the explorers went off and they discovered that these shiny rocks were large, uncut diamonds. The little boys did not have enough awareness to know what they had in their hands. And many of us are like that. Many of us have genius within us. We have ideas that we, we use it for the company. We have, we put in long hours, 60, 70 hours a week for the company store. We'll break our backs for the company. But when it comes to us, when it comes to using our genius in our own behalf, taking a chance with our own creativeness, acting on our own dreams and ideas, somewhere along the line we get paralyzed. We find some reason not to do it. Oh, I did that. I'm not as good as they are. I don't have their education. I felt inferior because I'd never had a college education. So I felt inferior. I thought people with college education were the most intelligent people in the world. And I felt inferior and intimidated by them. So I wouldn't want to speak before people that had more education than I did. What? Come on, Les, you can do that. Oh, no, I can't. Les, you're a good speaker, man. You can just communicate with people, period. Well, you know, they, you know I'm not, you, there's just some things I just don't know. And, I just, can I pass? You know, get somebody else. I got a friend, man, he, this guy has a master's degree. He's real good. You know, get him. But I just, I'm not the one to come speak to that group. See, I didn't know what I had in my hands. And fortunately, I had somebody around me who saw what I had and was willing to work with me until I could see it too. See, that's, that's what many times we have to have. Somebody could look beyond our thoughts and see our needs and, and hold that vision until we are able to capture that vision ourselves. How do we handle some fears? I was talking with my friend, Pat Johnson, who's the president of Begin Within Seminars. If think about some major fear you have, here's one thing she said, which is good. She said, Les, if you got a, a real major fear, she said, take a deep breath and see yourself strong enough and more than able to handle that fear, whatever it is. Everybody take a deep breath. Whatever that fear, just feel that you have the strength and the power and the capacity to handle it. Another friend of mine named Ron Weiner, he says, when I'm confronted with a fear, I just practice the art of looking beyond the fear. I go behind it and see it already completed, see it already resolved, and then I carry myself accordingly as if it already is taken care of. That dispels the fear for me. Another friend of mine by the name of Jack Wilson said, when I experience fear, I think about when I was in Vietnam and what I handled back then and I look at what I'm dealing with right now, and the fact that I survived that, the fact that I had other kind of situations that were close calls or that I was overwhelmed with fear and I came through it, then I look at this and says, this is nothing here. And we've all had that experience, what Jack had. How many of you had some situations that you were in that you were overwhelmed with fear? You didn't know how you're going to come out, how you're going to survive, and you did. You survived and you didn't die. Raise your hand if you survive, all right? So what you got to do Whatever that was, whatever that state of consciousness, whatever that self-confidence that you had, however you stood up within yourself, here's what we know, you survived. Here's what we know, you're still here. You didn't die. Hello, you did not die. You didn't die, you hear that? You didn't die, you're here right now. You got it and you handled that fear. You kicked it out of there, all right? Remember that play, Color Purple? I remember when, when Albert told the girl she couldn't go with Shul. Sure. He said, where are you going? You know, this girl had been wondering all her life, live her dream. But she was afraid. She felt incompetent, and he had beaten her down, and her self-esteem had eroded. He said, where are you going? You can't talk. Shul sure can talk. You ugly. You dumb. Shul sure got class. You ain't got nothing. Where are you going? You ain't going to make it. You're going to fail. She said, look here. I might be ugly. I might be dumb. I might can't talk. She said, but I'm still here. I'm still here. 
And so as you begin to look at the fears in back of you, you came through those fears and you're still here. See, that's a testament about how powerful you are. And so whatever the volcano is, you have the capacity to take that volcano on, the capacity to jump in it and find your true identity. Here's another thing that keep a lot of people from taking on the volcanoes and jumping into the challenges that they're confronted with. The fear of making mistakes or not feeling good enough. Guess what? You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. Guy said this and it's true. He said the person who has never made a mistake hasn't done anything. If you're going to make some mistakes if you want to do something out here. You're going to fall flat on your face. You're going to be criticized when you come out into the arena called life. You're going to feel awkward and stupid and dumb sometimes. It goes with the territory. But it's okay. What's important is that you bring your stuff out here. Are you good enough? Prepare yourself. See, there's no substitute for competency. A positive attitude won't get it. Being enthusiastic won't get it. So you've got to prepare yourself. You've got to develop yourself. You've got to practice. You've got to work. You've got to do your homework. You've got to do your research. See, a lot of people have a yes, I can attitude, but a no, I can't aptitude. <laughs> and competency builds confidence. And confidence feeds into competency. See, the better you become, the more confident you feel. And the more confident you feel, the better you want to become. You realize that you have no ceiling that you can better whatever you've done so far. You can go beyond that. You don't become cocky and arrogant, feeling that you've already arrived, as most people have. And that's why they've settled for less than what they rightly deserve in life, because they feel they have arrived. And they say, well, I can rest now. I can rest on my laurels now. I've, I've made it. <laughs> no, no, no. As long as you're breathing, you've got some more work to do. There's something else for you to achieve. The publisher of USA Today said that unless you've made some major mistakes in life, you haven't started living yet. So a lot of people, if you've never made any major blunders, made some major mistakes, lost some serious money, taken some serious risk, you haven't started living yet. You don't call that living, not rocking the boat, going through life quietly, tiptoeing safely to an early grave. No, 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 no. you got to take some chances. You want to bring some adventure to your life. Repeat after me, please. I will develop myself. I will develop myself. Sharpen, my Sharpen my skills. I'm good. I'm good. Better than good. Better than good. And, better than most. and better than most. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, keep getting better. <laughs> keep getting better. Keep getting better. Keep getting better. Here's something else. See, a lot of people, because they don't want to make any mistakes, it takes us to the next level. A lot of people don't want to fail. Fear of failure, fear of success, and guess what else? Fear of the unknown. I saw a guy last week, came up to visit me, haven't seen him for years. Bob Boyd from Columbus, Ohio. Bob Boyd introduced me to motivational tapes. Introduced me to a lot of motivational speakers and positive thinking in a multi-level marketing company at that time called Best Line Products had an inspirational leader named Bill Bailey. Jim Rowan was in that as well. And so Bob Boyd, that, that folded. And, but here's what about Bob Boyd. Why I was interested in seeing Bob last week that drove up from Columbus. Bob Boyd, that I know has been involved, personally I know, and I've been involved in business deals with him. Bob has had at least 30 failures that I know. 30 business failures since I've known him since 1972. Incredible. So I wanted to hear this deal that Bob was bringing me. Les, I've got to talk to you. <laughs> so he came in in the traditional Bob Boyd fashion. Hello, Les, how you doing? I said, fine, Bob. I wanted to know if Bob had lost in his fire or steam, had life beaten his dream out of him. Bob said, Les Brown, I've got a deal. You know, you get exposure to a lot of people. Man, I've got a deal. I'm thinking, does he want me to join Amway? What is this? <laughs> man, I've got something going. Man, this thing, man, Les, it's a money machine. I said, tell me about it, Bob. But here's what was going on in my mind. 
Bob didn't mention anything about all the losses, deals we'd lost some money on. He, it never came up in conversation. It was like this is the first deal he ever brought me. I said, what courage. You know what Winston Churchill said? <laughs> you know what Winston Churchill said about courage, Pat? He said, courage is the ability to go from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. <laughs> courageously hold on to your dream and not lose enthusiasm. See, Bob has not internalized failure. Things just didn't work out the way he wanted them to work out. He's still looking for his pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And he was so fired up, traditional Bob Boyd fan. He took his coat off. Les, let me tell you something, man. You've got to see this deal. With the things you're doing, you're now on PBS. My God, Les, you'll make a fortune. Man, I just can't wait to tell you about it. I said, tell me, Bob, tell me. <laughs> when he got to talking, I said, Bob, I want to be a part of it. He said, now explain to me what I just told you. I said, I don't know what it is, but I want to do it. I want to do it. <laughs> I didn't even know. I felt like the lady that was with Joe. Joe decided he's gonna jump in the volcano. He said, I'm gonna go with you. He said, oh, you can't go. She said, oh, I wanna go too. See, you get fired up about something. People will come to see you burn. They wanna go too. <laughs> so I like the fact that Bob has not lost his fire. Bob is still hungry. Bob still sees his dream. Bob is still searching for a way to make it happen. He doesn't care about people talking about it. Man, he's never kept a job. Guy's had 15 or 20 different jobs, all these business deals. Bob has turned a deaf ear to that. You know, that's what you gotta do if you wanna conquer your volcano. A guy in Los Angeles, all over the front page of the newspaper, he just passed the bar after taking it 48 times. That bar was his volcano. He had more than enough reason and excuses not to take it. His son has a law firm. He could have been a legal assistant, a clerk. And people all of a sudden used to laugh at this guy. He was a laughing stock. Are you taking the bar lately? <laughs> Can you imagine what they did to this dude? You know what that guy is? Man making a career taking the bar. <laughs> But by the way, he need to make a career to pass it. <laughs> people will do that too. You know, people talk about John Kennedy Jr. failing the bar. Did you read in the newspaper that he passed? Yes. I didn't see that. But did they make a bigger deal about him passing as they did when he failed? Yes. No. You know why? People like to see you fail. They like to see that. It, people like that. I don't know why it's set up like that. I was on the expressway. Traffic was jammed up. You know what was happening? It was an accident, but people pull over to the side to get out of their car to go look, to see somebody else is suffering. That's why talk shows are so popular. So people like to hear other people's misery, get it caught up in that. Then they go magnified in their own life because that's all they focus on. I bet not catch you going to any accidents here. <laughs> Bob Boyd went to conquer his volcano like that gentleman who decided it doesn't matter how many times I fail. I'm going to courageously pursue it. I don't care what people say. I don't care what they think. This is something that I want that gives my life meaning and value. You've got a volcano like that in you somewhere. There's something. See, at some point in time, all of us have seen our destiny. I was six years old, a man by the name of Reverend Ed Graham, a Mount Zion Baptist Church in Miami. I was six years old right before Christmas. My mother was ill. We had no food in the house. And this tall, strapping man around 6'1 came to the door with a food basket in his hand. And he says, hello, is this the Brown family? My mother said, yes. I understand that you have two sons and a daughter and that you have no food. Yes, I'm from Mount Zion Baptist Church. And around Christmas time, we pass out food baskets to needy families. Take the basket in behalf of the church and have a nice Christmas. And when he walked out, I said, Oh, boy, I'd like to be like that man. And I went to his church, and I used to watch him speak, and tall and powerful and dynamic speaker, such eloquence. Uh, one of his favorite people was the poet Kipling, who wrote 
If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. What eloquence he had. And I said, oh, I would hunt Wesley. I said, Wesley, I'd like to be like Reverend Graham. Boy, he's powerful. <laughs> a friend of mine, Mildred Singleton, my former fiance, she was with a school outing. <laughs> <laughs> but we're still good friends. She is in a... <laughs> Y'all always dipping in my stuff, but it y'all... Somebody say, I take you, it's all right. <laughs> but she was on a school outing and, and they took her to a hospital and she was in the operating room watching from a distance. And she saw someone working or doing eye surgery. She says, that's what I want to do. She's just a teenager and today she's an ophthalmologist. All of us have seen our destiny at some point in time and we decided not to listen. We decided to ignore it and say, no, that's, that's not for me. Life came in and slapped us side the head and we stopped dreaming anymore. Bigger Thomas said, the impulse to dream has been slowly beaten out of me through the experience of life. And that's what causes many of us to give up on our volcano. The experiences and the challenges, the defeats, the disappointments and the failures of life that we decide to prematurely throw in the towel on ourselves or to sell out on our true potential, sell out on living our dreams, feeling that we're not good enough, not wanting to make any mistakes, particularly if you're raised with a great deal of criticism. So you've got to be willing to prepare yourself and do the best you can, take your best shot and let the chips fall where they may. And so as you begin to look at people become afraid of success because they feel they're not good enough, they can't handle it, the responsibility is too big, I've been there. And when you feel that way, you begin to unconsciously work against yourself to make sure that you don't get it. You begin to sabotage your own potential in a variety of ways through procrastinating, through not taking care of business, not giving reports on time, not spending your time wisely, squandering your time looking at a lot of idle television or spend all your time lamenting and complaining about how bad things are, using your energy negatively rather than positively, complaining rather than producing. That's what we do when we're afraid of really making it. And when you're afraid of the unknown, when you're afraid to take that leap, when you're afraid to venture out there, that's a real challenge. I'm reminded about a little boy, two little guys were out playing on some ice that was supposed to have been solid. And one of the little boys stepped on a thin area of the ice and fell in a hole. And as he began to start thrashing in the water, he began to move with the undercurrent to other areas of the ice and his friend was there trying to help him beat and hitting the ice, trying to save his friend. And he panicked and he, he looked just a short distance away and there was a tree and he went and he ripped a branch off and he came back trying to get his buddy out and he just took the best he could to start scraping around the ice to make a circle and when he did he started beating on it and beating on it and there all of a sudden the ice began to crumble and he was able to pull his friend out to safety when the paramedics finally got there they saw what had happened how thick the ice was he saved the little boy's life but what baffled him they looked at the branch and they looked at this little scrawny guy and said, how did he do this? It's impossible. They just went beating around the ice to see how thick it was, hearing the thumping sound. Said, how did he do that? I mean, it was a miracle that he was able to just take that branch and go around, make a circle and beat the ice and pull him through. It's just too small. It's just impossible. And an old man standing around hearing the conversation stepped forward and said, I can tell you how he did it. He didn't have anybody here to tell him he couldn't do it. Yeah. See, sometimes life will happen to you like this little boy and you won't have time to say no. You won't have time to think that you can't do it. The only time you will have is to act, to take the leap of faith and believe that everything is going to be all right. Take that leap of faith. Trust yourself and know within yourself that everything's going to be all right. But aren't there some guarantees you can give us, Les? Yes. What is that? You're going to die. 
excuse me, you're going to die. In case you didn't understand that, you can't get out of life alive. So I'm saying to you, you got six months to live. Live your life now. Live your dreams now. Start acting like this is your last day on the planet. See, if we decide that we don't need a pronouncement from some physician to say we have six months to a year to live in order to really begin to appreciate the beauty of life, in order to really to make some hard decisions in life. See, we have the power in our hands. Like those little boys, we have that kind of power, that kind of genius, that kind of fortune, that kind of wealth, that kind of happiness, that kind of sense of fulfillment in our hands. We have that. We have that. It's in our hands. It's on us. And nobody can make that decision for us. We can give it away. We can give it to the company store for $400 or $500 a week. Or we can exchange it for how people think about us, how they feel about us and go through life and resign ourselves to be miserable as we go to our graves looking good for everybody else except to ourselves. Or well, we can decide, hey, wait, this is the only life that I have. And that is my volcano. And I'm going to take the leap of faith. I'm going to jump in it. And I'm going to handle it because I know the universe will never give me anything I don't have the capacity to handle. See, I say to you that you've got the power within you to handle any kind of volcano in your life, regardless of how it shows up, regardless of any kind of challenge that you might have in your life. I say to you, you've got that in you right now. Where will it come from? Don't worry. If you trust yourself, it will come to you at the right time in which you need it. If you believe and don't doubt if everything in you is something about life, I believe. That when a person resolves within themselves that this is how I give my life, this is how I'm forwarding myself into the universe. Dr. Johnny Youngblood out of New York, he said, I must live what's in me. This is why I've got to do this, Les. I must live what's in me. And all of us have something in us that we must live. And if we don't know what it is right now, we must create it or we must find it. All of us have this, whatever this, this something is that gives our life that meaning, that value, and that power, and that happiness. That happiness that a lot of people just wouldn't understand why you got to do it and why you got to take that mountain on. Don't you know, there be people who, who've decided that, that what they're doing is who they are. They've been acting this way for so long, they think their act is who they are. They've been evading themselves so long and, and tell that mediocrity is natural to them. They won't understand you. They won't understand why you've got to go and do what you've got to do. Why you might have to change cities or you've got to get another job. Why? What's wrong? This job is paying good. It's not to pay. It's not always the money. Yes, I need money, but I need something else other than money. I, I need some peace of mind. I need some fulfillment within me. It's, it's not giving me what I want. No, no, no. Well, what is it? I don't know. Why you gotta go? Why, why are you going now? I just, I don't, I don't want to live this anyway, anymore. I just, I'm out of here. Why? I don't expect you to understand. He who knows no explanation is necessary. And he who does not know, no explanation will suffice. I just got to go and jump in the volcano. Excuse me. <laughs> so I say, design your life so that it makes sense to you. It might not make sense to anybody else, but it makes sense to you. That's what's important. It makes you happy. It gives you that sense of joy. 
It brings back alive the little boy or the little girl in you. It helps you to have some special joy that other folk just won't understand. Go get your volcano. This is Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy, Leslie Calvin Brown, saying it's been a plum pleasing pleasure as well as a privilege. Thank y'all again. <laughs>